Hello, this is Don Mitchell. I'm glad to be back to speaking to you about the 16th and final chapter of the 2000% Solution. This is the eighth of eight steps in the eight-step process that's essential for accomplishing at least 20 times more with the same or less time, money, and effort. And this one is a simple step, uh, de a deceptively simple step, but I want to talk a little bit about uh, how you can think about it in ways that you'll understand some of its uh, complexities. It might not be obvious as you do the first reading of the 2000% Solution, the book that explains all of this. Now, in thinking about repeating the process, uh, it is important to keep in mind that we're talking about really two dimensions. One dimension is uh, relating to improving the same area. Uh, for instance, let's say, as the chapter uh, does, that you manufacture a product or perhaps you offer a service, in which case you would apply the process again to either that product or that service. Uh, and in doing so, uh, you would be intending to improve some aspect of the performance of that product or that service by at least 20 times. An example might be uh, increasing the size of the revenues by 20 times uh, or increasing the profits or the cash flow uh, by 20 times. Now, to do that uh, on each occasion, you would probably focus on something different, as the mustard example suggests. Uh, for instance, uh, if your costs are quite high right now, you might need to find some way to reduce those costs uh, dramatically, so you might initially focus on that. Uh, if you uh, cannot afford to do the kind of marketing that would be essential to grow uh, the product or the service, you might instead focus on uh, a very inexpensive way to get that marketing done, perhaps by using some viral marketing techniques, such as by having a great YouTube video. Uh, in the course of uh, doing all of that, however, each time you repeat it in this area, you probably focus on something uh, different. For example, now that the costs are down and the revenues are up, on a third time you apply the process to that area, you might, in fact, uh, do it by, uh, in fact, expanding uh, the nature of the uh, other kinds of products that you offer or the other kinds of services that you offer so that more of the needs that are unmet of the current and potential uh, users of the product or service would be met. Um, on a fourth iteration, uh, you might suddenly uh, be trying to think of a totally different way to deliver. For example, one of my students uh, offers uh, a studio where she provides exercise and dance classes including classical ballet as well as ballet for young children. Now, in the course of uh, doing this, a great limitation for her was the, the idea that you had to rent a space or you had to buy a space to, to operate these classes. Um, she then began to pioneer the notion of being able to offer virtual classes uh, so that uh, eight people would sign in on the Internet, uh, could watch her as she demonstrated, and she could watch them to coach them. And although they might be in different parts of the world, uh, she could, in fact, uh, deliver uh, this service to all of them, and they didn't have to actually be in the same location. And, of course, she could do this from her home. She didn't have to actually uh, rent you know, a special place to do this or buy a special place. Well, and, in fact, some people preferred to do this in private because they didn't want uh, to have to sort of expose themselves by walking through you know, a building uh, and in the course of uh, doing so, she also realized that there were a lot of people who needed to stay at home who could actually teach these classes. So she didn't have to teach them. She could find other people to teach them. And she could uh, expand this business kind of almost infinitely. So I think that's an example of how you might change the business model, the way you uh, provide the service or product uh, in such a fundamental way uh, that it adds some new dimension. Okay, so that's one thing. As we go to the same area, we keep making it better and better and better. Okay, now the second dimension of repeating the process is that 
This, uh, as suggested by Peter Drucker, as I talked about in the introduction, uh, is pretty close to a universal process. Uh, we don't know for sure that it is universal, but certainly closer to being universal than not being universal. So what do I mean by that? What I mean is that you can apply this uh, process to answer almost any problem or to solve uh, almost any uh, issue, whether uh, for an individual uh, or for uh, an organization or a group of people. So uh, as a result, uh, as you repeat uh, doing anything, you get better at it. I'm sure when you first uh, started riding a bicycle, you weren't very good. Uh, you probably had to have some training wheels or you rode a tricycle, in fact. Um, and then as you got better, uh, one of your parents perhaps took off one of the training wheels and you could kind of lean on the other one. And eventually both training wheels came off and somebody ran behind you holding the seat to be sure you didn't fall over until you got a good uh, good start and the uh, momentum would help uh, keep you up. Um, and then uh, at some point, you know, you could ride without falling down too often unless you ran into a, a stick or a rock or something. And, and then finally, you were able to probably go large distances, you know, uh, riding on a bicycle and having a great time doing so. Probably had a little better bicycle than you started with. Okay, well, the same thing applies to uh, learning how to accomplish 20 times more in any aspect of your life. The more times you repeat the process, uh, the more types of problems and more areas that you take this methodology into, the better you get at doing it. Uh, so some people have asked me uh, why it is that they can't uh, do it, you know, as rapidly, as easily as I can. Well, there's just a very simple answer. I've been using some version of this process for over 40 years, and I use it all the time in almost everything I do, whereas most people who are getting help from me uh, are using it really for the first time, and obviously they're not going to be as good at it. So I always try to be available to coach people for the first time or arrange for one of my most brilliant students uh, to coach them. And we're very fortunate that in many countries around the world, we do have uh, brilliant students who probably uh, actually can teach us quite a bit better than I can. And I encourage you uh, to uh, engage with one of those people. And if you're not sure how to do so, um, you can uh, contact me uh, through a different email that is in the book. Uh, to Don Mitchell, M-I-T-C-H-E-L-L, -L, at FAST, F-A-S-T, forward, F-O-R-W-A-R-D, 400.com. Uh, that's Don Mitchell at FAST, forward, 400.com, with the uh, 400 is 400. Okay, so uh, if uh, you would like to take on that challenge, I'm sure someone would be glad to help you. Some of them may charge a little bit for it, but it's well worth it, because if you're working on something that has a lot of potential value, uh, certainly an investment uh, uh, in this will be paid, uh, repaid uh, handsomely. Uh, as another uh, point of view, again, let me remind you that the 2000% uh, Solution Workbook uh, is a great tool for you to kind of substitute for some of that aid because what we, uh, Carol Coles and I did in that workbook is we took our experiences in uh, helping people go through the process for the first time and the kinds of things they had trouble with. And we added lots of questions beyond the many questions in the 2000% solution that would uh, guide people uh, to uh, be able to you know, find their own solutions without a lot of assistance. Now, and that, of course, that's great if you like to learn on your own, but obviously you may uh, like to learn with other people. So an alternative that we don't talk about in the book, uh, but which is certainly valid, uh, would be to uh, develop your first 2,000% solution with a team. A team uh, might be uh, members of your family. Uh, it might be uh, some of your buddies or friends. It might be some of your neighbors. Or if you uh, have a job in an uh, organization uh, or you volunteer in an organization, it might be people uh, either where you work or where you volunteer. Uh, or if you're involved with a church uh, or other religious activities, it might be something you could do through that organization. Now, in the course of uh, recognizing uh, these opportunities uh, to learn more easily, the key point is that um, uh, to make a comparison, 
Uh, so let's imagine something that you've learned that's immensely valuable to you. Uh, in my case, uh, it would be how to write books uh, because I can communicate ideas much better by writing them than I can by simply talking about them. Uh, the reason is that I can go into a lot more detail uh, and I can review what I'm doing very carefully so that it makes a great deal of sense uh, even if I'm not there to answer the questions. Now in the course of developing that skill, uh, it's something I've been working on you know, almost my entire life, so I've, so I've spent more than six decades learning how to be a better writer. And I still need a lot of help from my great editor, Breeze Adonato, to make these uh, books uh, you know, useful uh, to you. Now, in the course of uh, doing this, though, if I had stopped when I was quite young, when I first tried to write a little book when I was about 10 years old, um, you know, then there's a great deal of information that potentially could help every person on Earth that never would have been communicated. So similarly, you have some part of your life that's been much more fruitful uh, than everything else that you've done. Now, if you had only done that once, where would your level of skill be today? How much would you have accomplished? How many people would have been helped? How satisfied would you and others be with what you could do today? The answers to these questions probably would indicate that it's a good thing that you kept getting better. Uh, in fact, we see this all the time in professional sports. Uh, the people who have put the most effort in, uh, you know, uh, become the best. Uh, here in the New England area, we often think of the New England Patriots quarterback, uh, Tom Brady, as an example. Um, while he was in college, uh, he was viewed as uh, someone who was a perfectly good college quarterback, but probably not good enough to make it in the pros. Uh, he was undersized. Um, he uh, was uh, slow. Uh, he, his moves were not very crisp. His me uh, mechanics weren't very good and so forth. And it was actually it was kind of a surprise when he was uh, drafted in the sixth round by the New England Patriots uh, many, many years ago. And when he first showed up, he really wasn't good for anything, but he worked with great intensity. Uh, there were wonderful coaches at the Patriots, and they taught him what he needed to know. And, and he was worked harder than anyone else, uh, according to all the uh, news reports and uh, what his uh, teammates have said. And uh, lo and behold, uh, it's now approximately 18 years later, and he's still the quarterback for the New England Patriots, and in fact, he probably just had his best season, uh, bringing the Patriots from behind uh, to win an astonishing uh, uh, victory in Super Bowl 51, uh, where uh, almost all the fans had given up on the Patriots when they had fallen many touchdowns behind the third quarter. And yet, Brady led them back, uh, while a great effort from all of his other teammates uh, to win. And it was interesting. Uh, to read some of the reports after that win, uh, which is that uh, almost everyone indicated that at halftime, when uh, things looked very bad, everyone was still confident that they could win. And an amazing part of that, in most uh, cases, was the fact that they felt that Brady had the skill uh, to do it. Now, most professional football players in their careers are in their 20s. So Brady now is over 40. Uh, and it's thought that uh, you hit the wall at 40, yet here is a man who's hit his highest performance now. Now, he does some things that other athletes don't do. For instance, he watches a very strict diet, a very strict diet uh, that enables him to be healthier than uh, men many years younger. Uh, he also drinks no alcohol, uh, and so he doesn't have any debilitating effects of that or, or drugs, as, as best we know. Uh, the third thing that's, I think, very interesting about him is that he has learned uh, uh, mechanisms for how not to get hurt when somebody hits him. So he has a body that has been developed to be flexible rather than strong. Uh, football players tend to be like mighty oaks. They're planted in the ground, and uh, if you hit them, not much happens. But in the course of that, knees and, and elbows uh, take a lot of punishment. Uh, as well as ankles. Uh, what Brady uh, has discovered is that he can take a pretty big hit 
and he will just, you know, kind of bend with that, and by giving with it, uh, he in fact takes a lot of the force out of it, and there's not as much damage done to his body. So he's only had one substantial injury in the course of all of those years in the National Football League, which is truly astonishing. Of course, the Patriots have a huge incentive to keep him uh, healthy, uh, so uh, I'm sure that's part of it, too. I mean, the people who protect him get paid more than $10 million a year in, in some cases. So I hope that all of this will encourage you to not just do the 2000 solution once, but instead to do it many, many times. And so that at some point in your life, you'll be able to say what I am, what I can say, which is that this is almost second nature because you've done it so often. So with this encouragement, I thank you for your patience and uh, uh, listening to and watching this video and all the other videos in this series. And I'm, I hope that the 2000% solution will be a great blessing to you. So goodbye for now. Take care.